Hello, everybody, and happy Thursday to you. Welcome to the Witty Writer Show. And I'm here with the absolutely wonderful Joyce Reynolds Ward. Hello, Joyce. Hello. How is everybody? How are y'all doing? <laughs> you know, I love the fact that you are so chirpy and cheerful, and you've got such a beautiful smile, Joyce. I have been really looking forward to today. How are you? Oh, doing fine. Yesterday we were out cutting firewood and 90, well, actually it was 79 degrees where we were, but um, we were getting our firewood in for the winter and looking for morel mushrooms. And when I wasn't throwing wood in the back of the truck, I was sitting in the front of the truck going, <laughs> working on a project. <laughs> You are so like me. I, I, every opportunity I get, I am working on something. Uh, I think it's just the way our creative minds work. So you're doing lots of preparation at the moment for winter. Um, I, I know myself that there is, ne it's never too early to start cutting logs for for your your winter fire. <laughs> Well, we, we are, we're at uh, 39,000 or 3,900 feet elevation here. So we do get cold winters. Some winters we can get up to two or three feet of snow and uh, temperatures can get down to 20 degree or negative 20 Fahrenheit. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That makes life interesting when it's that cold. I can only imagine it's making it's, it's giving me a chill just thinking about it. <laughs> Everybody, um, because you are a prolific writer, um, science fiction, speculative fiction, and you've actually published 44 works uh, of various um, slight genre differences. Um, but also you've done short stories, anthologies, as well as full-on novels as well. I, I'm absolutely blown away. Well, thank you. It's the, it's the result of, oh, I would say over 30 years off and on of hard work writing and just thinking about it and planning. I mean, this kind of thing doesn't happen overnight. And that's just about, I mean, I wrote for a while in the 90s, things happened. And then I went back and seriously started writing again in about 2008. And so what you're seeing now when you go to my Amazon Central page is kind of the result of a sustained effort in writing and submitting. And because most of my short fiction and most of my short work is published by somebody else, but my novels are self-published. Yeah. yeah, I think it's absolutely amazing. I'm really good. We've already got people joining us, but I'm gonna pop them up so you can have a look and say hello. Um, we've got Josephine, who's in the UK. She says hello to you both. Hi, Josephine. <laughs> she is absolutely wonderful, she really is. We've also got Pamela, who's joined us. She says hi. And let's have a look. And we've got James. He says, hi, ladies. I finally made it better late than ever. I agree, James. Thank you all so much for joining. And don't forget, if you've got any questions to ask Joy, please pop them in the comments and I will put them on the screen for her so she can see them. So Joy, 30 years of writing is, is, is a very, very long time. Is writing something that you have always been passionate about, or did it build as you became an adult? Um, I've always been passionate about writing. I I joke because my first memory of writing was playing around with my dad's typewriter. There, the paper was yellow, and it was something about Mighty Mouse. <laughs> I was very young at the time, and then in my uh, fifth and sixth grade years, I wrote a trilogy of, you know, and this was a classic horse girl fantasy. It was about a teenage girl, and instead of a black stallion, it was a palomino 
thoroughbred Philly <laughs> that won the Triple Crown. And it was just, you know, that kind of wish fulfillment thing. I can't blame you on the on the horse. It's not absolutely stunning. It's a good choice as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I I mean I I had uh, I was participated in my junior high's literary magazine. I actually started writing and sending out stories when I was in high school, but I was kind of cocky and arrogant and didn't say, oh, and by the way, I'm a high school writer because, because I think I might have gotten a little more of a boost than in, than if I was just sending them out like I was. But you know, that's kind of the way it, that's kind of the way things are. If I could, I'd go back and tell myself, tell them you're in high school. <laughs> Hindsight is a wonderful thing, I have to tell you. <laughs> that's, that's absolutely wonderful though. It's great that you started, you know, uh, getting an interest so young. Um, and it's funny that you mentioned you, your father's typewriter because I actually asked for one one Christmas and I love that typewriters. There's something very therapeutic with the as you're tapping, isn't there? It, it's just a lovely sound. <laughs> well, I'm my, always, always tempted to get myself another one. <laughs> well, my parents gave me one of the a, a little portable typewriter with a cover and a book called Typing Made Easy. And they said, you can't write stories until you until you have gone through the book and learned how to touch type, which was actually at the time was very useful because I started typing my junior high assignments and then my high school assignments. And I moved from that, I wore out that little typewriter and moved on to a fairly nice for the era, manual Smith Corona. Ooh. And, and I kept you and that, that kept me going for a while until I was, Oh, the 90s when I got my first electric self-correcting typewriter, which was also a self-corona, <laughs> a Smith Corona. And actually, no, it was the 80s, the late 80s that I got that one. And boy, that was a big deal. You know? <laughs> I bet you were an absolute whiz on that. I bet you was 10 to the dozen. <laughs> Yeah. Well, if you look at if you look at the keys on my current laptop, which is MacBook Pro that I got in um, 2016, I'm wearing off the covers. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I have put I have I have worked that poor computer to, to death, but it's still chugging. I mean, you know. Well, it's obviously money well spent, I have to say. Um, Autumn Bobo has just joined us as well. She says, hi, Joyce. Hi, Autumn. Thank you for joining us, darling. Oh, and before I forget, um, Autumn is actually our winner from last week's giveaway from our interview with Jen Lowe. So congratulations, Autumn. You'll have one from last week. So well done, you. Um how on earth did you get inspired to write speculative fiction, Joyce? I mean, is that something, again, that you were passionate about from a young age, or did it develop as you got older? Um, I was passionate about speculative fiction, for yes, from about junior high. And one of the things that I really like to do is you're always going to have relationships in any kind of future, in any kind of technology. And I just, I, I, I mean, I, I read widely anyway, but there, you know, it was like, I don't want to read another one of these Manhattan based or I'm sorry, LA based. Or I want to read stories set in the future with, with, uh, you know, or set in the Pacific Northwest's future or something like that. My fantasy series is basically because I've only been to Europe twice. I have never, the only castle I have been in was the Louvre. Oh, well, wait, I guess the Rijksmuseum counts as a castle too. But honestly, the Louvre is the only castle I've been in. And so... 
And so I used settings that I knew for a high fantasy that was really basically non-European. Wow, that's just amazing. Honestly, I, I, I am truly blown away. Um, where did your your inspiration come from for, for your characters and, you know, your, your creativity and your world building? Is it all from imagination or do you think that things will just inspire you? Um, it's a little bit of everything from soup to nuts. I mean, um, the current series, I basically built, started that, well, a friend of mine at the Oricon Science Fiction Convention in 2019 said, hey, I'm starting a press, pitch me. And I was finishing up my fantasy series and I kind of, I'd been poking around at issues related to agricultural technology. And so I came up with, well, here's a, char here's a character. And for some reason, the name Ruby came up to me. She's a rancher. She's divorced in a ra rather nasty divorce, but she's also a scientist and a, you know, and a tech person, and she is creating biobots to combat climate change and be effective in the world of 2059. Things just kind of took off from there. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? How it just, it was just there. And her, and her, Ugly, originally her ugly cheating uh, ex-husband kept beating on me and saying, no, it didn't happen that way. There was a reason I started poking into it. A oh, whole boy were there reasons. I mean, it was a whole like he came from a fan, he came from a very affluent family with roots in the French aristocracy and <laughs> His, you know, and then it was the whole twisted story of his origin because the person he thought was his father was actually his uncle, and the person he thought he was his uncle is actually his father because of power plays. And I created this very manipulative, powerful, and I'm internationally powerful family that had this huge privately held corporation that is involved in agricultural technology. But this is also a world where if you go into debt, you fall into indentured servitude. Oh, God. And um, one of the issues is that the man that Gabe thinks is his uncle was abusing the um, indentured workers by implanting mind control programming into them against their will and doing other experimentation. Oh my gosh, what's going on? <laughs> There's a lot going on. The series is the series and I mean this is the first this is the first book. But I got to get it straight here. There we go. Other side. Yeah. Wonderful. Oh, yeah. This is the first book. The trilogy is from Ruby's point of view, but I have written two more books in the series. One from uh, Ruby's adopted son, Mike, who is the clone of Gabe's father. And the other one is Gabe's uh, point of view, going back to when he first testified against his what he thought was his uncle at the time and the exile he was forced into because if he didn't run, he was going to be killed. And he was subjected to mind, he had been, I mean, the whole family is subjected to mind control. That is amazing. Oh, my God. oh I'm so intrigued right now. It's unbelievable. I'm like, I don't know what happened. <laughs> and the book, well, the book I'm working on right now is Gabe's sister, Justine, who, with the, I mean, without Justine taking on their father repeatedly during her adult years, Gabe could not have eventually um, been able to do what he does. Right. And, and Justine, this is also a world where 
we start looking at there it's kind of handmaid's tale-ish in that there's repression of reproductive rights and reproductive freedoms especially for indentured people for indentured women and so Dang. yeah and so one of the things that justine it both justine and gabe were basically forced by philip their father to divorce the loves of their life and that's a major that's that's a major, that was the big thing that gabe was trying to get through to me when i was first writing the trilogy was that no i didn't leave ruby willingly i was i was manipulated and forced using mind control wow oh, i am so so intrigued and i love the handmaid's tale so it's uh, I, it's going to be straight up my alley as they say it really, really is. Yeah, yeah. You know, one of the things that I, I've been struggling to categorize it, and one of the things that came clear, especially after an interview I did a while, just, you know, recently, is that I really need to also be mentioning that this is women's fiction because yeah. it is talking about relationships. I mean, there's, it is talking about daily life in a science fiction setting, which is the kind of science fiction story I really like writing. Also, because this is Pride Month, I tend to have a number of, not so much my main characters, because it's not my own voice, but um, I have a lot of supporting characters that are LBGTQ, you know, QA. Uh, actually, Justine is ace, and she's right out front about it with everybody. And, oh. But there, you know, in the in the trilogy, um, two of the major supporting players, um, Charlie and Martin, are mar are a married gay couple and i have other you know there's others where it, it may not be in the text but if you ask me i'm gonna go nope they're not they're not cis they're not het <laughs> I, you, lo I love the fact that you've got such diverse characters i think that's absolutely amazing um especially nowadays because it's becoming more you know open and talked about and accepted and you know obviously society's still got a long way to go but you know with authors like yourself who do have characters um you know who are gay or fluid it makes a big difference giving people a voice doesn't it even if they're fictional characters you're still giving them a voice um which i think is absolutely wonderful i really do um james has got a question for you i'm gonna pop this up so you can have a look he says, Joy, do you have any advice on what to say when people ask you where you get your ideas from? I hate that question. <laughs> I'm not as bad as Harlan Ellison. I don't have a post office box in Schenectady. <laughs> but, you know, for, it's just little things can kick off my ideas. And I just say, I get my ideas from the world around me. I mean, I have a short story that um, was, it's kind of a very dark little short story. It's up on my Curious Fictions page called So Sorry About Your Loss, about an, an alien invasion, but you follow the alien invasion through um, precognitive greeting cards. And it starts with, so, so and, and the kickoff for that one was I, when I was teaching, there was one, spring where it just seemed like we were getting hit with one event after another and i think it was the school secretary signing one saying you know i think they've got a greeting card for every occasion and it's like well what if you had an alien invasion with precognitive cards so that um someone whose spouse has died fighting the aliens gets a greeting card from the aliens saying so sorry about your loss before <laughs> the, the authorities inform them. And it goes all the way through, including, so sorry you've lost your apartment. 
Oh, <laughs> that is brilliant. I absolutely love that. <gasps> oh, there was a big name. There was a big name editor who just blew up at me about that one. And I think yeah. I pressed the hot button. But no, there's there's things like that. Another one, Witch Trails, came from a teaching in service. And I mean, so it's just kind of those little things. The 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 foundational seed for the Martini Air Legacy series was that a story I saw and I thought, you know, of course I'm following technology news, but um, it's talking about computer programs in tractors. And the fact that John Deere puts uh, digital rights management on the software in the, the tractors they sell. So if a tractor breaks down in the middle of harvest, you have to get a John Deere tractor IT guy out there to fix it because, and the farmer can't hack it him or herself. And so that, that just kicked, you know, I started like poking at this and researching that. And it was like, Oh, and that's, that's one thing too. A, a tip I'm going to throw to a bunch of other, uh, to any other speculative fiction writer take a really close look at what's happening in agricultural technology these days, because there's some pretty aggressive mechanisms for fighting climate change, for carbon capture, for maximizing productivity. And I mean, they're being used now. Yeah. Uh, our agricultural lands and our, and our um, livestock producers are much more effective. I mean, and at the same time this was happening, I was talking to local people out here in ranch country and one person at a uh, fish trap uh, fireside reading, the fish trap is our local literary organization. And he was saying, well, you know, most cattle these days are sold before they're even born and they're auctioned off online. I went, oh. That's interesting, but it is true. And there's, I subscribe to um, the Ag Thunder News e newsletter, and the stuff that comes through biologics and uh, microbials and this and that, there, there's, and almost nobody is really looking at that and writing. There's so much room in the world of what I call agripunk. <laughs> you can rule. I, I agree, and and you would think with with climate change escalating so rapidly, you would think there'd be more of an interest in it. Um, and it's funny because that, that's something that I'm quite passionate about as well. Um, especially the fact that you know, even though it's now proven that tilling land actually releases the carbon into the atmosphere. You would think there would be more. There would be more knowledge passed to people in agriculture to let them know to stop tilling. Oh, there's, there's a, it's more not. There's more known about it than you would think. At least in my part of the world. Mm -hmm. um, early when I first lived here in Wallowa County in 1981, and in the early 80s, there were. Farm, where there were wheat farmers experimenting with no-till then. The Palouse region in Washington, which is incredibly productive with wheat, has a lot of no-till. The big problem with no-till, especially in the early days, was the uh, heavy reliance on pesticides and herbicides. And that's been one of the big issues. And I was talking to a local wheat rancher when I was putting this together, and he said, where it, it's an ongoing war yeah sites and that's where i got the biobot idea was talking to earl and and thinking well how do you stay ahead without you know getting into more and more toxic stuff and that's kind of what experimentation is doing they're doing um it's not mr rna but there's things like rnai which they're, they're doing, and you will even find that Monsanto 
and some of the big producers are looking into RNA manipulation to battle weeds because weeds and pests because it is an issue. Yeah, I think sometimes the old ways are the best ways. And obviously in the olden days, they used to use birds to eat all the bugs and the pests and stuff like that. So I think they should just go back to what used to work and was natural. The problem, <laughs> the problem, the problem with that is productivity. Yeah. Uh, and the, fa the fact is, is that we can continue to feed our population because of ongoing agricultural and technological research. Mm. And that's, that's really, I mean, that's the big issue is that we, organic, for example, classic organic is insufficiently productive. People would be starving if we, all, if we went straight organic. And that's unfortunate, but true. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's crazy. I, I'm just glad it's inspired you to write these fabulous books. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, and, and then of course the corporate soap opera and the family stuff came in, and it's so there's not as I know I know more about what's going on than what actually showed up in the book, but but you know, I the and the, the other piece of the book that fell together is that we were driving back and forth between Portland and Enterprise about a six hour drive regularly. And driving through the Dells one day, I heard this ad about vote for the Dells so we can win $500,000 to promote our city and do this and that. And I found out that there was an online social media contest for small cities and small towns where they, and it's primarily the number of votes they get online and the winner, the winning city, gets a bunch of PR and promotional support, but they also invest, and it's like five hundred thousand dollars that what? is poured into a city. And I went, now what if I was to take that and apply that to agricultural research funding so that a rancher or farmer experimenting with a new technology could go on into this competition and you know, so I set up this competition called the Ag Innovator with different levels. And then, you know, so Ruby and Gabe had won it, the uh, inaugural one, or technically Ruby did because Gabe was st still in hiding, but, but he was there. But they won what was called the Ag Superstar, which was 10 years, but they had to keep requalifying. And part of the break process of the breakup meant that they lost that funding wow. as while divorcing. But 25 years later, their son is working for the Ag Innovator, and he's helping create what's known as the Ag Superhero, which is a 3.75 million payout for, I forget how many years, I think five years. And it's like, so he goes to his estranged parents who are not talking to each other and haven't for 20 some years and gets them both into the contest. And in the process of dealing with the contest, things blow up. <laughs> but that's the first book of the trilogy is wow. part of the, the implications and what happens as a result of that competition. And it was just, so that idea just popped up driving through a town and listening to the local radio station. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? It, it just goes to show that, you know, each author is so different, you know, from, from not only their writing styles and their interests, but also where their inspiration comes from. And, you know, you write, it can come from literally anywhere. Oh, it yeah. It really can. Whatever you're more in tune with personally, I think. Um, James James has another another little comment. He says, Joyce, do you have any witty comebacks when people ask where you get your ideas from? Oh, hang on, well, we've already had that one, haven't we? Oh, yeah. oh, oh witty comeback. He's, he's my, my witty comeback is I get them from everywhere. <laughs> yeah, it is true, it is true. Um, I think, oh, there we go. And James is agreeing with you. He says, I think I read that. <laughs> He's all up there as well. Um, 
Now, Joyce, you've, as I said earlier, you've written lots of anthologies, short stories, and full novels, including your fabulous trilogy. And you've just released um, a new book in April, which is called Broken Angel, which is a cy cyberpunk sci-fi. Out of anthology, short stories, and novels, which do you find the easiest to write? And which ones do you enjoy doing the most? I think the long form. Um, I can do short form, and I've actually managed my most recent short form works. I've managed to get them down to about 3,000 to 4,000 words, but I like the freedom to kind of I won't say I won't say ramble, but to develop um, plot twists and let the story unfold. Now, granted, my short stories are not that bad. Too bad. I mean, I I do have a, a semi finalist in the Writers of the Future um, placement to my credit, but. I frequently short, you know, where I can rip out 2,000 to 5,000 words a day when I'm going good on a novel, that would be my output for the week when I am writing a short story. And part of that is that the short form needs to be carefully thought out. Every word matters. And there's a lot of times when I'm writing something short where it's like, Oh, I'd love to go down that. No, I can't because then that blows it up. My fantasy novel, Pledges of Honor, the first book of the Goddesses Honor series, I sent the first chapter off only at the time. It was a short story because I was trying to get my head in. I've been trying to get that, that particular world to work for me for over 30 some years and never got the entry point to it. So I wrote a short story about a character in that world. I sent it off to a, an editor who oddly enough had the same name as a, one of my teaching colleagues who was in the room next to me. And the rejection she sent back was, um, you know, this is the first chapter of a novel. I sat down, I looked at it. I thought about it and it went, you know, she's right. Now, I wouldn't have done this except the combination of she was right and then that um, her name was the same as my neighbor teaching <laughs> in teaching. And I said, you know, I just wanted to write and tell you, you were correct. This is the first chapter of a novel. And oh, by the way, I don't think you're sitting in the room next to me teaching, but you have the same name. <laughs> and she laughed. Well, well, that's that's very funny. <laughs> that is amazing. Obviously, fate just stepped in there for you, I think. <laughs> yeah, and, and that actually, that novel ended up picking up a uh, self published fantasy blog off semi finalist position. I seem to be really popular in the semi-finalist range. <laughs> Listen, that's better than not getting anywhere. I tell you, I'd be thrilled to, thrilled to bits. <laughs> oh yeah, you know that's that's kind of the way it rolls like that. But that is brilliant. Yeah. And obviously, you know, you you are part of uh, literary groups. Um, for the authors that are watching, do you feel that being part of writing groups? is really helpful with your career and personal development? I think the, for me, the most crucial part is the sharing of wisdom between, between um, authors. Uh, I participate in a number of writing oriented groups on Facebook. I participate in the writing community hashtag on, on Twitter, but, the sharing of wisdom. Um, I don't do, I did, I've had bad experiences with critique groups. That's kind of, you know, people either love them or hate them. And I'm one of the ones that I came down. It doesn't work for me. I end up writing for them and it does, it doesn't work for me. But, but going to 
workshops, going to literary gatherings, and just talking with people, going to science fiction conventions and sharing things with other writers, talking online with other writers. That's really helpful because um, it's really important to listen to other writers. Um, it's really important to kind of just, you know, I, I am, when I have someone asking me a question, I try to answer the best I can because I had authors who did that for me when I, years ago when I was starting out where they, they answered questions, they gave me advice. Sometimes they even gave me a hand up and that's really, I do think that networking with other writers is, it's important for survival. Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Even with the pandemic, um, Autumn, Autumn Bardo and I, we decided to create our own online group. And it's amazing what you can get out of it. You know, as you said, if you, you know, help and support each other and not act like you're in competition. Yeah, I mean, because we're, because re, there are, so, each reader is individual. And yeah. what, your reader is may not be what my reader is. And that's just kind of the way it, and there's so many readers out there that it just, I always get really annoyed when I see these writers who think it's all about, oh, we have to compete with each other. And it's all like, blah, blah, blah. and I'm going, no, <laughs> it's not. It's not that, it's not a competition like that. No, it really, really isn't. And let's face it, you know, most people will read a book that they love within two to four days, depending on their schedule. And they'll devour that book. Reading that book, it's over and done with so quickly, they're moving on to the next one and then the next one and the next one. And I, and I think many authors forget that, don't they? They forget that there is room for everybody. And the other thing, too, is that um, I taught special ed for 10 years, middle school special education. I worked with struggling readers and struggling writers. And the things that motivated students could be so very different. Yeah. Um, now, granted, uh, there are issues with Harry Potter, but... By golly, I saw a lot of writers or a lot of readers get started because they heard the buzz. Um, yep. Same with Twilight, because that was during, uh, yeah, I started teaching about the era that Harry Potter was feeding, and then here came Twilight. And I had girl students who were just, their mothers would take them to midnight book purchase parties and and they would show up with t-shirts with twilight stuff written all over them and it was it was just the thing i also had students who were like graphic novels sucked them in and it was through the process of working with graphic novels that they started working their way into regular textbooks and and get developing that but it took the combination of pictures and words to make it work and it, you know these days there's so many different ways i just learned about story apps with the arrival announcement of kindle vela yeah and i've got one piece up and i'm going back through some novellas i have that i haven't really that i i threw them on paper I didn't really want to put the work into them to turn them into full-sized or big enough piece of work to go through the process of getting the cover and doing this and doing that. And I'm looking at them and going, you know, these things might work for a story app. And so I'm dipping my toe in the water with story apps for with Kindle Vela. And I took a class with a author to, um, Kilby Blades, who is a very well-known uh, story app writer, and it, and like she said, these are you know, no, 
kids are still reading, but they're not reading the traditional. Yeah. Horror. And so, but they are consuming story. And I'm like, for me, it's not so much about the words as it is about the story. And so I went, hmm, I think I want to check this out. And so I'm, I've got, that's kind of my project that I'm doing out in the woods when when the husband has fired up the chainsaw and I don't, and it's not time for me to go out and start lugging the lugging the chunks to the truck and throwing them in. I'm sitting in, which, hey, this, my pickup is, has a very, is a very comfortable writing location. It's almost like they designed it for the passenger seat for the writer. And so, but that's kind of what my current project is, is I'm taking a novella and putting it in a appropriate format for Kindle Vela upload. Yeah. Now for, for the viewers who are watching, if you're all from Kindle Vela, um, which is something I've mentioned before, but it's a new, new platform for authors and writers. And basically you, you upload small chapters of your work and people can pay for a subscription and they can literally check out all your episodes, if you like, of, of all chapters of your work. Um, and they can actually, if they really like what you're uploading, um, they can click and click you as one of their favorites and stuff. And obviously get notified when you upload a new chapter um, or a new episode. Um, and it's great for royalties as well, isn't it? Joyce, it, it, the royalty rate is very good for writers because I've looked into it. So it is something which I think is going to really take off. I think so. I think so too, especially now like with Vela, you, can, you can't have it up as a book, but you can have it on other story platforms. Yes. As long as they're paid. And so, you know, I'm going to, like I said, I, I, I'm dipping my toe in the water, but I think it's an excellent medium for me for these projects that really have only gone so far and yeah. I don't want to take the effort to blow them up into a full-size novel. Yeah. I think that's a really good way of doing it. I really, really do. Um, Joyce says, uh, sorry, beg your pardon. Autumn says readers read many books and yes. many genres. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Francisco has just joined us as well. He says, hi, ladies. Hello, hello, hello. Um, yeah, those, you're going to have to let us know how you get on with, with Kindle Vela because you're the first one that I actually, the first author I know of who's actually going to give it a go. Um, so that would be really interesting to, to share. Um, and also, and I would love to put any feedback that you have in our write better author smarter facebook group for the other authors to you know to read and and find out more that would be fantastic there's so, also a discord out there for kindle villa that oh really yeah there's a, a discord group called kindle villa where people are talking about what they're doing that's probably a good place to be looking Interesting. That is definitely something I'm going to have to look out look out for. Now, as I said earlier, Joyce, you've just released your new novel, which is Broken Angel, which is a cyberpunk sci-fi. That came out in April. What are you currently working on? I'm working on uh, another book in the Martini Air Legacy. Broken Angel is a Martini Air Legacy. It's Gabe's 30 Years Before the Trilogy. Um, this one is his sister Justine's 30 Years, the 30 Years Before the Trilogy. It's called Justine Fixes Everything, Reflections on Mortality. And that's because she has developed the reputation within the Martinier family and its family with a capital F. They're very, they are very adamant about that. And she's the fan. So there's kind of, there's an, the A plot is she's been asked to tell her to, to you know, to tell stories to keep 
her nephew, who is also the clone of her father, <laughs> Mike, distracted so that he doesn't poke into stuff that's going to really flip him out while he recovers from a very nasty situation. And so she's tell as she tells these stories, there's a there's a plot line there. And those are the that's the interludes. But there's the stories she tells, so the sequential going on about how she basically went toe-to-toe -to -toe with her sociopathic, autocratic, megalomaniac father and fought him to a standstill in her own way, but also how she ended up being forced into divorce and how she coped with that. But it's not all dark because she does end up re reuniting with her husband, with her ex-husband. Oh. And, and the two of them together consp have conspired for years and worked together secretly to um, promote, re you know, to support reproductive rights amongst these indentured workers, indentured women workers we're being subjected to some pretty horrific stuff. Oh my yeah. God. It's called and the rescue angel. And, oh, what? and that's what their organization is. It started out with real lives for women, which and I, I mean, the open, the opening is when her father is beating on her, her, who she thinks is her cousin, but is actually her brother rescues her along with and i mean this is in the french the man the family mansion in paris at family christmas it's a big deal and it's like her, her uncle is just desperate he looks at her and says the only way we can keep you safe is you need to find a man who is reliable marry him and get out from under your father and she's 17 and she goes from that but she marries into a fam to she marries a man whose mother is very active in reproductive rights and women's rights as and because he was raised by a woman he is very much that kind of man and Interesting. and he just you know very early on he just looks at her and says you are my falcon and someday you're going to outfly me and wow. you know, yeah, I love that. I absolutely love that. And, and when are you? Are you hoping to have it published this year? I'm hoping to get it out by fall. I'm going to uh, a subplot or a storyline from that is currently up on Kindle Bella. If it goes live before I'm ready to publish, great. If it doesn't, well, I'll pull it down. But but um, it is yeah, it's going to go up this year. How exciting. Now, Pamela has got a question. Um, she says, regarding Kindle Vella, you're giving me good food for thought on our current projects. I haven't been sure what to do with them. Been too scared to go too far ahead of myself. Thank you, ladies. That's, that's wonderful, Pamela. And it is an option because I believe that you can, you can upload your chapters or episodes of your work, but you can still publish it as a full novel if you want to, can't you? So I think you've got both options available. And I think it's a great way of testing the water with reading. And if people are loving it, then you know it's worthwhile putting it out there as a full novel. Right. And, you know, you have to pull it, you know, now with Vela, you have to pull it down before you can publish it as a book. Yeah. I have to the other serial story apps, but I, I don't think that's a universal thing. But mm -hmm. I think for me, like I have about, no, oh, I don't know, four, four, three or four projects that have never really gone anywhere past you know, they start petering out at about 20,000, 30,000 words. Well, that's not really enough to put up as a book. And, yeah. and I don't, you know, I don't like the project well enough to do that. So to, to put that much energy into it. So there's, 
this is perfect for those shorter length long form that you know you want to get the idea you want to get the story out there but it's not something that's necessarily going to be bigger one yeah. of the things i can hear about from people and now maybe that will change with vela but there are a lot of people who are thinking that they're going to be putting up novel length projects i don't think that's the medium for it because no i agree i, I think there's a there's an untapped market for short reads. Books and stories that people can read in their lunch break or you know, when they they just want something that's not too heavy. That has been a you know a long tap market for a very, very long time. I think Kindle Vella is gonna fill that gap. And I mean it's it's not a new market if you think about it. If you look back to 19th century, and again, self-publishing in many cases. Um, the serial no novels of the 19th century. What was Charles Dixon? What was Charles Dickens writing? What was Louisa May Alcott writing? That wasn't Little Women. I yeah. mean, she was writing a lot of blood and thunder stuff that was serialized. Yeah. And that's, there was a lot of, you know, Anthony Trollope was doing a lot of the same thing. And it was, it's just, you put out, you put out the cereal and you keep it going and people, people keep reading. There's, so it's, it's an existing market that I don't think has been um, really addressed in the 20th century. And now the 21st century is getting around to doing it. So. And it's about time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, we've, oh, Liana has joined us from Australia. She says, good morning. Good Hello, morning. darling. Um, and Mariah has joined us and she says, do you think there is a general structure to follow to get yourself started in writing or do you think it's more unique to each author? I think it really comes down to you have to spend your time writing. And you have to spend a lot of time writing. Writing, you have to approach it like you were building yourself up for a sport or anything. It's a skill, and like yeah. any skill, it takes practice. When I was, I had taken a writing class in college where the teacher just basically said, "Here's the deal: take ten minutes and just journal." You know, whatever comes into your head, you know, little thoughts, story ideas, take those moments, but just get the words on paper and realize that it takes a lot of words to develop your voice. Yeah, it really does. It and really I, yeah, and that's just reality. Yeah. Um, one of my mentors, the late Jay Lake, used to say, yeah, overnight success means at least 10 years of hard work that you know you couldn't that is such a true saying i don't think people realize um writing the book is probably the easiest bit oh <laughs> I, I hate the i hate the marketing bit production yeah. is not quite as crazy except when i'm sitting there with ingram spark like i was this morning and going no, I pushed that button. No. Uh, oh. Ah. <laughs> oh my gosh. I, I know it is crazy. I think I spend more time doing self promotion and marketing than anything else. Um, but Mariah, that is such a good question because there is no set way for for writing a book or a novel or any type of writing. It's such a personalized thing, isn't it, Joyce? You know, so many authors pre-plan, do outlines, they do characterization charts, you know, they go all out and that really, really helps them. Yet there are authors like myself who just go with the flow. And I've tried to pre-plan, I've tried to outline, and all it does is it halts my productivity. I, it completely stalls me because I literally end up over, overthinking everything. 
So after after writing three novels, I now just go with the flow and, and I just write. Because if I overthink it, I'm done. I, it just stalled me completely. So it's very individual, isn't it, Joyce? You know, and I'm sure, you, obviously, you know, you're in writing groups. You are very friendly with a lot of authors of all genres. It's purely individual, isn't it? It's purely individual, and you know your your process can change over time. Yeah. I I have ranged from going with the flow to where I sat down and did what I called a scene matrix, where I listed the name of every character, and then I listed where they were in each scene. But this was again, this was a multi point of view story it was complicated it was widely spread and it was fast-paced and yeah. so so i've done everything from that degree of very controlling to kind of what i'm doing now on the martini or legacy stories where it is kind of a flow i know where i'm going to end up now granted my research tab in scrivener has timeline, character notes, revision notes, and things like that. But I have, uh, the, the one thing I haven't done is I have not really done the character sheet. For me, that doesn't necessarily work. But no, for me either. They just, they, they just create themselves in my head and I'm good with that. <laughs> you know, what I'll do is I'll write, you know, I'll, I'll write a short story about them. Yeah. Which is another good, which is a very, very good way of, of getting out of writer's block, or I'll call it having a creative rest. Um, and it's a very good technique for that as well. Joyce, I could literally talk to you for hours. Unfortunately, our time is literally almost up, and you've been an absolute joy. We have still got more comments and questions popping up. So if you wouldn't mind keeping up with the comments for the next few days or week, just so readers can and authors can hear back from you that would be wonderful um before we do go i just want to tell everybody who's watching um please go to my author page where this video will be um and check out my latest giveaway look it's a summer giveaway i don't know if you can see that isn't that beautiful oh, that's beautiful isn't that gorgeous um that is my summer giveaway prize it is silver and it's stunning with mother of pearl look you can see there look mother of pearl um and all you have to do to try and win this beautiful necklace is share my book promo video which is my latest one it is beautiful so share it tag five of you if you're of your friends and you could win this stunning necklace Joyce, you have been an absolute pleasure to talk to. Thank you so much for joining me today. You are absolutely awesome. Um, viewers, please do check out all of Joyce's links, which are attached to her interview. Um, she's got social media everywhere, and I've also included her website and everything as well. Um, and she's got some amazing books on Amazon, so please go and have a look. Um, and she also has an audio book which is the alien savvy audio book so check that one out as well but joyce thank you so much my darling i hope we can do this again in the future oh definitely maybe we need to talk about justine when her book comes out <laughs> yes. oh my gosh we definitely need to catch up again that is for sure Thank you everyone for watching and please join us um, for the next Witty Writers Show. And don't forget to check out my upcoming event with Mark Gottlieb uh, from Trident Media. He's a top literary agent. It will be your chance to ask any question you like and we'll be doing that live at the end of the month. So make sure you keep posted. Bye for now, everybody. Bye, Bye Joyce. Thank you.